Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna be talking about what actually happens when you calculate impedance using an impedance calculator like Altium Designer or Symbior or Polar Instruments. So all of these impedance calculators are calculating a lossless impedance. And for those of you familiar with copper losses and dielectric losses, you'll know that the real impedance that you see in a test or simulation is not the lossless impedance. What are you supposed to do if you're designing a transmission line to a defined impedance value? That's what we're gonna look at today in this video. Let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Now the topic of this video is all about impedance solvers in EDA tools, and specifically what happens when you use the impedance solver in something like Altium Designer or an external tool like Symbior or Polar Instruments. Now these impedance solvers are calculating various pieces of information, and the intention is to give you a value for impedance that you can use to set a width constraint in your PCB design software, and you can use that constraint everywhere and at all frequencies. Unfortunately, if you've watched any of my other videos, you will know that roughness or copper losses and dielectric losses both impact the impedance and the loss profile at different frequencies. What that means is that the single value that you get from an impedance solver like the one in Altium Designer or Symbior or in Polar Instruments doesn't tell you the full story. And so you'll need to figure out some way to compensate for those expected losses in your design on the front end when you're defining your routing constraints. So that's what we're gonna show you how to do in this video. So to really understand this topic, let's take a look at some example calculations in these EDA tools. Here inside of Altium Designer, I've created a blank PCB and I have the PCB stack up open. You can see here we have a really simple PCB with just two layers because we're gonna be using microstrips in this example. Here we have a solder mask, we have 8.5 mil thickness, we have a DK of four and a DF of 0 0.002. Now, if I bring up the impedance tab in the layer stack manager and I add an impedance profile, it's going to automatically calculate the width that I need in order to hit this target 50 ohm impedance that you can see here on screen. So folks who already use the impedance tool inside of Altium Designer should know exactly how this works. Now, unfortunately, this does not tell you the whole story because it's not telling you anything about the roughness and the dielectric loss at various frequencies in this design. And unfortunately, those can create a deviation in the impedance that actually arises in the board. The value of the impedance that's seen by a signal on these transmission lines might not actually be 50 ohms. It could be very different at different frequencies. Now you can see here in the layer stack manager, we do have some options to add in, for example, copper roughness. Now copper itself already creates some additional impedance due to the skin effect as signals propagate along a transmission line. But of course the copper roughness will just add in some additional loss. Now, even if I add in a really egregious amount of roughness, like for example, you know, 20 microns, that's a lot of roughness. You'll see here that the width value doesn't actually change here. So it's not really accounting for the roughness in this lossless impedance calculation. Now here we've tried to modulate the copper loss, but what about the dielectric loss? Well, even if I go back over here to the stack up and I change the loss tangent value for this laminate to also a really egregious value. Here I'm gonna put in 0.2, which is a really large value compared to a typical FR4 laminates, which have a DF of 0 0.02. I put in that 0 0.2 value, we'll go back to the impedance tab, and you can see here that when I calculate the impedance, it does force you to use a slightly different value of the impedance. It's only changed the width by 0.2 mils, but it also doesn't account for the fact that that dielectric loss changes over frequency and can also then produce a deviation in the impedance, which is then also a function of frequency. So what that really says is that this impedance value that you see here of 50 ohms really depends on the value of frequency, and we don't actually know which frequency it's being calculated at in the layer stack manager. Now, how does all of this compare with the results from a tool like Polar? Well, here I have Polar Instruments SI9000 pulled up, and I've programmed in the same stack up that we had in Altium Designer. And here, if I wanna calculate a 50 ohm impedance, again, I just enter the 50 ohm target, calculate the width value, and you can see here that it gives us a width of 16 mils with a predefined etch factor, and that gives us a 50 ohm impedance. Now, that's pretty close to the value from Altium Designer. 
I think the value in Altium was like 15.964 mils or something like that. And this comes out to 16 mils. And even if I copy this 16 mils at the base of the trace, and then I eliminate the etch factor by enforcing that same width at the top of the trace, recalculate the impedance, it still gives me 49.49 ohms. So only a 1% difference in the target impedance. So again, here we do get an impedance value, but we have no idea what frequency this is supposed to correspond to, and we don't have any idea of how the losses are going to create deviation in this impedance at different frequencies. So that's one of the drawbacks of these lossless calculations. You really have no visibility into how losses are going to affect the impedance. Now let's compare all of this to the results from Symbior. Now Symbior does have a lossless impedance calculator. Now normally I'm using it to calculate the full S parameters, but we can actually use it to get a lossless impedance. So here I can create just a basic transmission line. And if I click through and select my signals, select a strip line, I can calculate a strip width given a target impedance. And you can see here that Symbior gives a 16.67 mil strip width requirement, assuming a rectangular profile. Now here, of course, I can change the profile. For example, I can set an etch factor if I like, and then recalculate the impedance. But the point here is it's basically doing the exact same thing. It's calculating a lossless impedance using this geometry that I've set up inside of the tool. You can also change, for example, the value of the strip width, enter in a value that you would like to calculate, just click the calculate button and it will give you an impedance value. And you can see here it comes out to 51.2. So all these values are really close to each other, which is exactly what we'd expect. Now we don't really know what all these tools are doing in the background. They have different models that are running in the different tools. And of course they're gonna give slightly different results, but they are all pretty consistent in terms of order of magnitude, and they only deviate from each other by a half ohm to an ohm of impedance. Now, what does the impedance profile look like if we actually have the ability to account for things like dielectric loss, and we have the ability to account for things like roughness? Well, if we go back into Symbior, we can calculate all of that and display it on a graph. I'm just clicking through and running a simulation, and we can see exactly how the impedance varies over different frequencies. In this example, we actually designed this line to have a target impedance of 50 ohms, but you can see here that the impedance actually varies over a broad frequency range. We get this kind of drop off coming into about a half a gigahertz, and then it passes right around our target impedance of 50 ohms, and then it starts to rise again as the losses take over and start to contribute to the impedance. Now in this model for the impedance, we've used a modified Hammerstad model to describe the roughness and its effect on the impedance and losses. And that modified Hammerstad model assumes a surface roughness here of two microns. Now we can technically add in whatever value of roughness that we like, but of course we wanna use roughness values that correspond to typical values on copper films that are commercially available. And anything in the range of approximately two microns is typically what you would use for this modeling. If you're using something like an ultra low profile copper, such as you might find on, for example, a Rogers laminate, that could be below a micron and even as low as 0.35 microns. Now the dielectric constant has dispersion as well. For those of you who know what dispersion is, you'll know that the dielectric constant is not constant across all frequencies. It actually varies as a function of frequency. And if you look in some material data sheets, you'll be able to see how that dielectric constant varies across a broad frequency range. Now Symbior does account for the dispersion, but we can actually visualize the dispersion inside of Polar. So here, if I go to the frequency dependent calculation, there's an option to look at the causally extrapolated dielectric constant and loss tangent. If we just click edit here, we set up the frequency range that matches our Symbior simulation and click calculate. You can see here that it gives us an estimate of how the dielectric constant varies over a broad frequency range. And you can see that right here in this graph. We can also get an estimate of how the loss tangent varies over a broad frequency range. So you can see here very clearly that the dielectric constant and the loss tangent are actually not constant. And that's what has to be accounted for in these more complex models to determine impedance. Now Symbior accounts for that in this graph here. And that's why you get some of this big variation across these various frequency ranges, as you can see in this graph. 
Now, is there any way to actually visualize this same type of curve, but without getting a license for one of these solvers and maybe using, for example, Waddle's equations and then determining what the variation is in impedance over frequency? Well, as it turns out, there is. And I've published an article on the Altium website that guides you through how to do this. And it is a bit complex and it requires using an Excel calculator. But here you can see I have created one of these Excel calculators. So what this Excel calculator does is it takes Waddle's equations for a microstrip line and then it calculates the variation in impedance over frequency, assuming that you have a copper roughness model like the Hammerstad model and you have some values or tabulated data for the dielectric constant and loss tangent also as a function of frequency. Now you can see here on screen that I have one of these results that incorporates roughness and the variation in the loss tangent into the calculation. And you can see that it actually does pretty much the same thing that we see in the Symbior results. But again, this is all calculated by hand using the impedance formula that you have here on screen from Waddle's textbook. So you can see here that we start from a high impedance and then it comes down and reaches a minimum right around one gigahertz. And then it starts to rise again as the losses start to take over. Now, when you incorporate losses from the copper and from the dielectric and you incorporate copper roughness into the impedance calculation, the impedance is no longer just a real number. It's actually a complex number. So it has a real part, which is the real or resistive impedance, and it has an imaginary part or the reactive impedance. And you can see here I've broken off the reactive impedance as well in this graph. Now, I think it's pretty remarkable that just using this simple model from Waddle and adding back in the losses from the dielectric and the copper and adding in copper roughness basically gives you the same curve shape that we see in a more advanced tool like Symbior. Now, normally in high speed design where we need controlled impedance, what we're really interested in at the end of the day is the S parameters. And the S parameters are going to be used to determine whether or not the channel is compliant to some target or some standard. And we can calculate the S parameters both in Symbior and in Polar. Polar is just calculating them using an idealized transmission line. But we can go ahead and do that here and take a look at what those S parameters look like. And even in the S parameters, by incorporating the roughness and the dielectric loss, we can see here that we get the same kind of variation in the amplitude of this S parameter graph over frequency. What's interesting about this graph is we almost get the same exact type of variation in the amplitude of this return loss curve that we saw in Symbior and in the analytical model. So that's extremely interesting. Here we get higher return loss because we have higher deviation below about a gigahertz. And then we can see that it reaches the minimum return loss in this region. And then it starts to rise again as the losses start to take over. Now, even though we're interested in the S parameters for this transmission line, can we get the impedance from the S parameters? As it turns out, we can we can get an input impedance from the return loss graph. And then once you know the input impedance and the propagation constant and the length of the line, you can then calculate what is the characteristic impedance of the line as a function of frequency. So you can see here in this graph, what I've done is I've extracted the input impedance from a set of S parameter data for some transmission lines as a function of roughness of the copper that makes up the line. Now the midpoint of each of these curves is approximately the characteristic impedance of the line as a function of frequency. And you can see that you get a lot of variation ultimately going all the way out to 100 gigahertz. Now the reason for the periodicity in these curves is because of the hyperbolic tangent function that appears in the input impedance function for a transmission line. Now, some of the midpoints here are going to be higher or lower than the others, but they all illustrate the same thing. Once you add in the dielectric and the copper losses and you add in the copper roughness, you get this variation in the impedance over the frequency range that we see here. All of the lines that were used to get this data were all designed to have an impedance of exactly 50 ohms using a lossless impedance solver. And so this really illustrates the point that even if you design to exactly 50 ohms using your lossless impedance solver, what do you get? Well, you get actual lines that have an impedance of more like 51 ohms or maybe even 52 ohms in different frequency ranges. So if you're a PCB designer and you're trying to determine a width constraint for your controlled impedance lines to use in your PCB design tool, what should you do about all this? 
how should you set the width constraint and what impedance value should you use in your lossless impedance solver? Well, based on the data that you see here on screen, we can see that these curves are all consistently between a half ohm and one and a half ohm larger than the target lossless impedance value. So what we can do is we can try to just design the line to a slightly lower impedance value. Then we know that once the line is actually put into the PCB and the signal starts propagating along it, it's going to see a slightly higher impedance. So if you're working in Altium Designer, and you know that you're gonna be operating with signals that require a bandwidth into the say 10 or 20 gigahertz range, what you can do is design the target impedance to just be slightly lower than this 50 ohm target. For example, we can just design to a 49 ohm target. And by designing to that 49 ohm target and calculating the width, you'll see here that the width adjusts to that target impedance. By setting just a slightly wider width constraint, you'll be able to give your line just a little bit lower impedance in the lossless calculation, and that will give you just enough margin to account for the real losses that arise from the dielectric and the copper and copper roughness. The other thing you should do if you're working in these frequency ranges is you should try to figure out an etch factor and incorporate that into your lossless calculation. Now, everything that we did in these examples assumed rectangular traces, which is not totally accurate. There will be some etch factor that will cause the traces to appear slightly trapezoidal and not rectangular. That etch factor could also depend on the copper weight that you use in the PCB. So different copper weights could have slightly different etch factors. You can usually get that data from your fabrication house. If you need the design to control impedance and you only have a lossless solver, make sure to get that etch factor data and you can incorporate that here inside the impedance solver in Altium Designer. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to check out the links in the video description. Those resources will help you understand how to incorporate and compensate for copper losses and dielectric losses when designing controlled impedance PCBs with a lossless impedance calculator. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section, and don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time.